This cycle paints a very, this article paints a very bleak outlook with regard to millennials. Now, the article, I believe, gave the age group to be somewhere in the early 20s to the late 30s, saying that this group is less and less interested in religion. Now, I wish somebody, whoever, it was a Pew study or whatever, I wish they would have taken the time to, done, to do some uh, brief analysis. Instead of feeding out to the masses almost what we should think, because I'm, I'm actually not convinced that that's the truth. And I'll, I'll tell you why right now. If you think about it, that age group of people, um, of young people, essentially is the product of, look at their parents and the generation, if they were at all involved in the church or listening. And what you have is a very interesting kind of window of about maybe the last 30 or 40 years, this decline. But the decline, if you kind of look at it this way, or the distancing from religion or spiritual things, is in direct correlation, and it is in direct correlation, to how, as society, we've moved away from certain things. There is no real sense of religious education, which used to be mandatory. I think my generation, which kind of is at the very edge of that, was probably the last generation to have religious education in the school. See, it's not enough to ask people about religion because religion is like a broad brushstroke. What does it mean? It's different for everybody. And so I'm not a religious person. Does religion mean somehow that I, I have to bow before something? And, or, or is religion that I simply live in my little cloister? Or is religion a manner of attire and, and humility? What is it is so dynamically diverse in people's description that we lose track of the essence of what we should be focusing on? Just take the word in the English, religion. Re, which is a prefix that points us back to again, and legion, which actually comes to, if you trace it etymologically, it could be to bind again, to read again, to reaffirm again, to come back to some beginning point. In other words, it is a re-attachment to something which suggests that we were and have been disconnected. So when somebody says, I'm not religious, think about kind of the silly thought process of that. What exactly does that mean? I'm not reattached? I'm not rebound? I mean, people think that that word, religious or religion, brings some understanding. But as I said to you, the definition, ask any two people and you'll get a different answer of what it means. Now, if I say to you, which I've said many times, I'm not religious, but I'm spiritual. I'm trying to tell people, I'm trying to telegraph that I believe in what the Bible says. I believe in the Savior Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. I believe that he died for me. When I talk about that realm, it's perfectly clear. So why am I saying this? I think if we were to ask the millennials, do you believe you're going to die? That's a better question. Do you know why? The answer is absolutely. There is no cure as of yet. There is no cure for death. So if I were to ask any millennial, do you believe eventually you will die? The answer must be yes, unless you're a lunatic. So then that begs the question, what happens to you when you die? Where do you go? And what, what exactly do you believe in? If you have no, wait for my air quotes, if you have no religious belief, and there is nothing that you can glean from this book, tell me, what exactly do you believe? And there opens up the Pandora's box because there is very little. And I'm just telling you, you ha who have been listening to me for the last few weeks, I've said this before, there is very little material on eternity, on heaven and hell out there for anyone to read, let alone any messages explaining, describing, helping people to understand. So we, we actually 
I want you to think about what I'm going to say because it is the most truthful statement I can say. If you, let me give some random thought, you're going to take a vacation. It's a vacation of a lifetime. You're going to go to some great foreign land. Aren't you going to be looking at the pictures? Yeah? Huh? Ex now, we have internet, so the folks here in, in, in the good old book didn't, but we have internet. We can go online and look at pictures, right? The pictures excite us. They, they give us some great idea of where we're going. We get excited about it, right? Kind of. One person got excited. <laughs> but we start looking. Okay, I need to ask the question because I'm, I'm now wondering, has anybody here ever gone on a vacation at any time? <laughs> like, you're all looking at me like I got three heads. Okay, somewhere in the last 20 years, somebody in this room, <laughs> getting desperate here, work with me, okay, has planned a vacation of a lifetime, and you've gone, you've looked at the pictures, and you've checked out, okay, when we get there, this is what we're going to do, and this is how we're going to do it, and oh, what's the currency, and what language do they speak? You ask all these questions, right? You get excited about going there. Why? Because it looks like paradise sometimes described as heaven on earth, right? <laughs> now, take that same example of what I just said and apply it to heaven. Suddenly, there's no enthusiasm. Like, oh, well, I can't get excited about that. I haven't seen any pictures. I can't get excited about that because I don't even know what I'm going to be doing there. I can't get excited about that because that means I won't be here. This is the problem. Because we don't have enough information. We can't even get excited about telling people. And then there's this part, because people say, well, there's just not enough in the book for us to know. And that is a mistake. Why? I'm, I hope I will have enough time to paint the picture, but there's enough in this book that tells me all you have to do today is step outside and look around you. And I know this sounds a little strange, but you, you will see heaven. You say, well, how do you figure that? Because all I see is a bunch of lunatics driving out in the street. Well, let's see. In the book of Hebrews, heaven is called a city. A city has people. I mean, I can take different words from different places, but Hebrews actually has a lot of these. It's a city. It is a place, a real place, a city. Um, we're told about the kingdom. Well, everything points to people, but if you talk about a city, a city requires inhabitants. And when we talk about a city, we talk about people, we talk about things around us. Don't think for a minute that eventually, and I, I'm going to introduce some terminology today that will sound a little weird, but it, it, it'll be necessary to understand how I'm going to explain this. There is what we'll call the present heaven and the future heaven. The present heaven, absent with the body, present with the Lord, the future heaven, right back here on earth, new heaven, new earth. These principles are often not distinguished clearly. So when we say, you know, somebody dies and you say, Grandpa's in heaven. For a child, the child's imagination of what heaven is like actually is kind of exciting because a child sees or imagines the splendor. But we tend to have more of a gloom and doom picture. And that's why I said to you, imagine using words from this book when we talk about the New Jerusalem and the city is described and the streets are described Everything that has capacity to, to be pulled out of the book, when John sees into heaven, he looks into heaven, God lets him get a glimpse, and there are people singing. That means that we will not be mute in heaven. There are people who are actually engaging in worship. It means that we will not be bored. In fact, we will be worshiping. And don't think of heaven as a full-time church service either. Because if that's the case, most of you are going to be sleeping. But, I'm just saying, but if you start taking the pieces of information that are in here, you realize that we have enough information to paint a picture. 
and we should be excited about it. We should be talking about it. The problem is because we end our conversations at death and rest in peace on a tombstone, or because we have been indoctrinated, and this is, this is a huge problem. It's a problem for me, it's a problem for you, because we're, we're flesh. We think death and dying, and we think darkness, gray, bleak, uh, dismal. But if you read a lot of the ancient literature, especially the writers up until maybe the fifth or sixth century, you will find people absolutely dazzled. And when I, I'm using that's the only word that I can use that's an adjective to describe the, the joy, the, the imagination of what it will be like. And somehow we get to now, most current writers, I mean, there's very little talk about this place called heaven because we dare not leave the earth. But what if I told you, you've got time here on earth, and when your time is up, whatever time that is, this body is laid down and the soul is essentially the essential being of the person that is attached to what God sent into your heart. We'll call it the spirit and soul that are locked together and into God's presence awaiting the resurrection and new body. Suddenly, it seems like everything that if I really am looking at it with truthfulness, not imagination, not false hope, but truthfulness of what I'm gleaning from here, and I'm, I have the knowledge that I, in that state, will be forever with him, and I'll be back here, not like Arnold saying I'll be back, I will be back here, and you will be back here when the new earth is created, is radical. But it's not that radical because it's in this book. So why is it, what is it about death and dying? For many of us, we refuse to, even though we've come to know the truth, we refuse to jar ourselves out of the gloom and despair that comes. Well, that's because we don't have a clear picture of where we're going. You see, I go back to my vacation. And in my vacation, I'm looking at all the pictures and I'm looking at everything and I see it vividly and I know that when I get there, at least if the pictures are right, I will be dazzled by what I see. I had a glimmer of it. Now, why is it that I can look at that and I can get excited about that, but I can't get excited for this thing over here? It means the picture's not clear enough and I cannot see. If I really could see what this is all about and this is referring to eternity, and I had a clear picture of it. And it's not just the white or the white sand and the blue ocean of some tropical destination. This is a destination that its glory and splendor is even more than anything my eyes in the flesh could identify with. I might be more excited. I might be actually talking about it like it's a real place. Well, guess what? It's a real place. And my job will be to paint the best picture that I can for you. So that over the course of time, when we revisit these messages, there will be some clarity and some certainty about the destination for every believer. So, okay, so the first thing is let's separate, and I'm trying to figure out the best way to do this. So Genesis and not not including Genesis, so we'll go Genesis 1 and 2, and then we'll say, watch my, my abbreviations, the rest of the Bible, excluding Revelation. I know, you're like, wow, what's happening here? So you have here creation that is perfect, the origins of mankind. Here we have fallen creation. That's throughout the Bible. And it's only the last two chapters where we have a real glimmer, a real clue of, we'll call it, the resurrected life. So the last two chapters. We've got creation of, I'll put under here, mankind. This may get a little messy here, so indulge me, but forgive me. I, sometimes it's hard to read. I try to not write over my writing like um, 
Somebody else did? <laughs> All right. Earth in its creation, which was perfect. Then we have fallen earth and new earth. You know, if you, if you line this up, you know, it's, it's 66 books, but if you line it up, you can see clearly that when people say, well, I don't know about the book, well, it's kind of a strange accident. It's, then it's a happy accident. First two chapters, last two chapters, and the rest of the book tells you about the unfolding drama of the redemption of mankind. So if you keep going, you have here, God was on the earth, right? Then during the time, which is the rest of the Bible, excluding the last two cha chapters, we have God essentially at a distance. He appears in Christophanies and Theophanies, but he's at a distance. He is present, but at a distance. So we're going to put here distant, present, but distant, and then back here on earth. So it's kind of interesting. When you start looking at all of this, you can really see the beginning here. We had no curse. Here, everything is cursed. If you ever stop to ask yourself, what would the animal kingdom be like without the earth being cursed? We know what we would be like, kind of, without being cursed or being under the curse of the fall. But what would the animal kingdom or what would plant life be like? And I, I, I guess a lot of times we cease to ask these questions because we think we've asked them all or we've, we've answered them all. But I think the answers to those questions are found in some of the chapters of Isaiah where it talks about a diversity of animals who would be natural enemies laying down together and being in harmony. I don't know if, you know, sometimes you read that and you think, how is that possible? But maybe that would be exactly what it would be like, devoid of a curse, here we have the curse, no more. Curse is lifted because it's a new creation, new heaven, new earth. Now, as I begin, as I said, to try and fill in and paint a, a picture that has more color and more vibrancy, some will start to actually say, I can start to see it. I can start to see the destination, and it's, it's not... It's not the destination of blue skies and white sand, it's the destination of endless joy. It's the destination of never being separated from God. It's the destination of complete and utter fulfillment and nothing lacking. So I don't know why this subject has been so neglected, but perhaps I say this, perhaps in ignorance or in fear or whatever it is, but my, I, it's now clear to me. I had to kind of formulate a little bit better. How am I going to get to this point? How am I going to explain this? And every week I've been thinking, well, I need to do a word study. I need to show you the words. But the reality is, before I can even do that, I need to paint the picture. And the picture begins with understanding there will be a period of time that if you read what Peter says, he says that essentially all this is going to be burned up. It's all going to go away. Now, Peter was given understanding and visions of things that we haven't gotten. We have them through his word. John was given visions of things that we haven't gotten, but we get them through his word. So I'm taking all of that, plus the, the vision, the clarity, the prophecies of Isaiah and Ezekiel, of Daniel and Jeremiah, to fill in the blanks to show that there wasn't a time in this whole book from cover to cover, save for the first two chapters, where there wasn't a thought of needing another place in man's mind, not in God's mind, but in man's mind that God had a plan all the time, and his plan was to have that perfect communion. God will have his way. God will get what he wants. As I'm reading this, it says very clearly that there will be people that will enjoy the new earth. So the next question that's asked for people that want to know, well, how will I get there? How, how am I going to ensure that I get there? Well, there's only one way to do it. And I've said this a bazillion times, and that's not an exaggeration. Faith. Not faith in faith. Faith in the risen Savior. Everything in our Christian walk, everything, begins and ends with the resurrection of Jesus Christ. If you don't have that straight, the rest of your faith is going to fall apart. Why? Because it says Jesus 
is the first fruit. He's the first goer. He's the first of his kind. He's the first. Well, there are many people that died and that were brought back to life, but died again. But he's the first to, be, to come back to life. No one, he says, no one takes my life. I lay it down on myself. But he took it to be raised up again to the words that he spoke saying on the third day, which came to pass. He came out of that tomb, showed himself to his disciples, and as Paul says, and to above 500 brethren at once who, were, who saw. And all I can tell you is that fact of the resurrection starts, the, we'll call it the foundation for understanding eternal principles, for understanding the restoration and reconciliation of humankind. And if I look at my first and second Genesis, the rest of the Bible and the rest of until the last two chapters of the book, it is essentially a universal, universal fight for the soul of humankind to be reconnected. And there is a negative side to this. And I've said this before, but I'll say it in a different way. And the negative side is that just like I referenced at the beginning of this message, how young people seem to be, or at least we're told, young people are disinterested in religion and the subject of God and understanding religious education, if you will. I'm going to tell you something. The sad, sad, sad part of this is that without education of this book, you cannot know God, you cannot know about heaven, you cannot know about hell, you can't know about anything pertaining to these. And this is, what's, this is what is killing the church today and the future of the church because if these messages are being put out and they're, it's black and white, it just is a fact. We have not come to the point yet. Science has not arrived at the point to be able to say that we have established how man can live here on earth in this day and age forever and not die. That has not happened yet. You can say, well, but we're, we're approaching it. We're fast approaching it. Well, um, maybe people are living longer, but they are still not in control of their final, the years allotted to them, are controlled by him. You say, well, we can manipulate it a bit. Well, we can maybe, but that's all we can do. Millennials and all people alike will face the same end result. And if we are doing our job, I'm now talking to pastors out there, teachers and ministers, if you're doing your job and you're doing what you're supposed to do, we are telling people explaining and taking away the fear. I'm not here to try and give you some fire and brimstone so you see you make a decision today that you will follow Jesus because you don't want to go to hell. Wrong, because you might still end up going to hell anyway because it's for the wrong reasons. God's looking at the heart saying, I'm not interested in people saying, I just don't want to go to hell. I'll, I'll believe in this because I just don't want to go to hell versus I believe in you, Jesus, and I want to be with you. And Jesus says, come on. It's just that simple. So I don't want to complicate, nor do I want to scare, but what I do want to do is educate. And as I said, I am painting the picture that when, hopefully when I'm done, we will have accomplished, one, the understanding that this is a real place, this is the ultimate um, destination that each person can find out for themselves in their lifetime. This isn't something where you say, well, I, gee, I really hope I'm going to go to the right place. I really hope. Are you kidding me? This is not a lottery. This is not a, I, I toss the dice and I hope it comes out properly. This is, you put your heart and soul in the hands of him who spoke your name before you ever were, saying, I trust you to lead into God. Don't trust me. Do not trust Melissa Scott or any other person. But you trust God and you take him at his word and you say, if, if, if this is the one that spoke and called my name and brought me into the realm of desiring to know him, then I will follow this course all the way until I get to see him, because I'm determined. This is each person has to be with that mindset. I am determined to live my life by faith, and I will see him. I am not perfect. I've made mistakes. I'll continue to make mistakes. I sin. I will continue to sin. But I look and understand it, what the word says. The forgiveness that God gives me is not a one-time deal. He did it one time, but I keep going back every day and I talk to him afresh and anew and tell him about all of my issues, and there's a lot of them. 
but that's all he asks me to do. He knows my frame. What does Ecclesiastes 12, 7 say? Essentially, from the dust we were taken, and from the dust we return, save the soul and the spirit of the individual that returns back to God. Ecclesiastes 12, 7 makes it abundantly clear. This may be laid down for a time, but what God has placed in my heart, or better yet, where it says God has placed eternity in their hearts, I know it's in mine. I know it's in yours. So the only thing to do is to understand, get a real clue of where this ultimate destination, which is not some hot spot for a, um, a brief, un, you know, limited time, but a place to go that is a real place, a real destination, and it is not something that somebody says, well, well uh, I can imagine this. Well, you have a great imagination, Pastor Scott. No, I don't, actually. This book tells me exactly what I need to know. Now, I'm earnestly praying. You know, I'm, I'm asking you, actually, to kind of come along with me in this prayer. It is my desire that people might come by accident to hear this message or this series of messages. Because, you know, we can live delusionally. We can live in, and we do, I think most of us, most of us, I'm including myself, live in a delusion. The delusion is, I'm fine, you go along, you, you go to bed, you wake up the next day, and as long as you're waking up the next day and going to bed at nighttime, you do it all over again, all is good in the world, right? But there will come a day don't, don't believe anybody telling you, like somebody said to me, well, you believe in soul sleep? Hey, you crazy? You know, there's this, an expression in the Bible that says that they, ha they are asleep. That's talking about the body. That's not talking about the soul. So all I know is absent from the body, present with the Lord, and looking to that ultimate beautiful place. I'm excited. I don't want to leave here just yet because I know I've got work to do. I don't want you to leave here just yet because I know God's got things for you to do. But it shouldn't be looked on as a place where people say, oh, it's gloom and despair, it's the end of the road, and that's that. Now, how about, as I've said, this is boot camp. Down here is boot camp for eternity. Learn the lessons now because there will not be some, uh, well, I have to say this right, there will not be somebody standing in the middle like an information desk. <laughs> Excuse me, can you tell me where to go to? No. It's, I learned it down here. I'm equipped. Why do you think those words, Paul says, equipping of the saints. It is for us to have and glean the knowledge in the now to be able to navigate the course all the way home by faith.